which Jerome will continue to tell us about continuity uh, or discontinuity of the optics. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so we continue where we left off last time. So here, uh, this is where you can find uh, the, the, the slides. Okay, so today we want to essentially uh, to review some uh, basic tools in entropy theory. Okay, the basic in the first uh, part and in the second part, uh, we talk about uh, Yambin theory. Okay, so first I have to finish the, the part about uh, the Lyapunov exponent, especially if you remember, I stopped uh, just before the punchline. <laughs> so let me uh, remind us so the setting is we are looking at a diffeomorphism on a surface, and we are in dimension two. And this simplifies uh, uh, significantly uh, the questions. So to study the, so as we said, the Lyapunov exponent is an integral, but, with, but of a measurable and usually not continuous function if we want to look at things on the surface itself. So therefore there is no continuity property. I mean, and then we, we had this uh, corollary of Kingman's theorem that told us that uh, we have only, uh, we have upper semi-continuity. And we know that lower semi-continuity can, can fail, or at least I said so. And to understand what the failure of uh, this uh, semi-continuity means, then we, we introduced the projective dynamics, okay, on, the, on M hat, the projective uh, bundle, okay, uh, over each point you have the set of uh, one dimensional vector subspaces, the set of directions, okay, and we have the dilation function, this phi hat, which is uh, just, uh, okay, since now in the projective bundle, you have not only the point, but the direction, you can look at the differential applied to this one dimensional direction, and it gives you a dilation. I don't know. Okay, uh, you take the log because we want to, we are used to take uh, sums. Okay, and we saw that over the set of points for which you have two distinct, well defined Lyapunov exponent, uh, lambda plus and lambda minus, this X shark that you have the Biocelletet's theorem, you have these two, uh, these two sections, uh, E plus and E minus, that define two uh, graphs, uh, these two graphs, uh, gamma plus and gamma minus. Okay, and since, uh, since the functions uh, uh, E plus and E minus directions, e, e plus and E minus given by the Ocelletet's theorem are measurable, and equivalent, uh, these, uh, the variable graphs are uh, invariant measurable subsets of the, of M hat of the projective model. Okay, and we studied uh, lifts on the, of, how can you, how can you lift a measure, uh, an invariant measure for F to an invariant measure for F hat for the projective extension. And we saw in particular that when you have a, a measure such that at almost every point, you have two distinct Lyapunov exponent. So you have well-defined directions, E plus and E minus. Then we can define a stable and unstable lifts. Well, the unstable lift is a mu hat plus and the stable one mu minus plus, which are characterized by the fact that for instance, mu hat plus uh, leaves on gamma plus. So, okay. Any question about that? Okay. So now, what, now we want to to apply all this to understand this the discontinuities. So we take a sequence of ergodic uh, measures mu k uh, on the surface. <coughs> we suppose that. They have uh, they are they are 
of this, uh, there are two, two exponents. And uh, now, uh, let's say, up to just by compactness, uh, passing to a subsequence, if we, want, if we need, we can assume that uh, not only these measures, but their uh, unstable lift uh, converge in the weak star topology towards some measure. This is this new hat. Okay, so here we don't assume anything special about new hat. I mean, automatically, it will be an invariant probability measure, but it doesn't have to be ergodic. So it has some ergodic decomposition, okay, which I, uh, I wrote in some way. Okay, and now we, so now we, so for almost every uh, ergodic component, uh, we can look at its uh, projection. Okay, uh, be careful, the, the integral of this new uh, zeta is not exactly the ergodic decomposition, okay, because the, the same measure uh, can appear as a projection of different uh, measures above. Okay, and now we, I, want, I need to introduce a subset of the ergodic decomposition, this Z uh, minus, which, uh, which is defined in this way. Uh, you look at the ergodic component, which have two uh, distinct Lyapunov exponents. Some may have uh, only uh, one exponent, that is equality between the top and the bottom and which are the, uh, the, the stable, sorry, the stable lift of their projection. Okay, so this is these notations. Uh, you take, you look at your uh, ergodic component of new hat. This is this new, new uh, zeta hat. And now you project it and you lift it back using the stable uh, graph, you get this stable uh, uh, lift. And this Z minus is, uh, to summarize, the set of ergodic components which are carried by the stable graph. Okay, so let me just, let me just say that if this is for the limiting measure, if we apply the same thing to mu k, this would be empty, or at least have zero measure, because here our assumption is that so far there would be, uh, well, this, this measure, this mu k ha, mu k plus, sorry, is exactly the unstable lift of mu k. So there, this, this, there would not be uh, such a thing. Okay, so, and now the trench line, so we, again, we write mu for the projection of mu hat. I mean, our objects are defined in the projective uh, extension, we project them. And what we, uh, what we claim is that the limit of the top exponents of the mu k is equal to the top exponent of the limit. Okay, if we didn't have anything more this would be saying that, that this exponent is continuous. And the defect in continuity comes from this term. Okay, we, it, so we have a formula for this defect, which is the integral over this part of the uh, ergodic decomposition of mu hat, that is the part which is of, made of stable lift. Okay, and we integrate over that. Uh, the difference between the positive, the top and the bottom exponent. Okay, so this function is uh, always positive on, uh, on uh, Z minus, okay, because of the definition of Z minus. Okay, so what we get here is that this is that uh, we can have a discontinuity in the, Lyapunov, in the top Lyapunov exponent. But we have it exactly. So first we have a formula, and this formula tells us that it comes ex the possibility of a discontinuity comes exactly from the possibility that some mass of the mu k plus 
which are concentrated on, on gamma plus by definition, by construction, uh, may link in the limit uh, into uh, gamma minus the, stab the, the stable graph. Okay, and there's no, nothing really surprising in that, in the sense that, as we said, these graphs are invariant, but only measurable in general. So there is no reason why uh, measures cannot uh, leak for, from one to the other when we take a weak limit. Okay, so this is a, a simple computation. So let me let me do it because I think it's uh, it's uh, helpful. And the proof is in some sense simpler than the statement. Okay, so we want to compute this to me by what we saw last time. Oh, okay. This is the integral with respect to the unstable limit of the dead dilation. Okay, now we are uh, looking at an integral uh, of a continuous function. So just by definition of the weak star topology, this is uh, exactly uh, the integral with respect to the limit. Okay, and now we, we write, we uh, explicit, we use the analytic decomposition. Okay, this is an integral, it's a complete integral with respect to the analytic uh, decomposition. Okay, and now I just treat according to uh, the type of the, the algorithmic component. So you have the, uh, let me call it Z0, where the two, ex the two exponents are equal, plus, of course, I have the type where the two exponent, the algorithmic component for which the two exponents are distinct. Uh, but I'm looking at the unstable lift. Okay, this, I should say, the, these guys by definition are ergodic. So they are ergodic lift of their projection, uh, which must be ergodic. Uh, and therefore, they can only be either the two exponents are equal, and I don't know exactly what the, what the lift should look like, but if the two exponents are different, I have only these two possibilities for the lift, that is uh, mu zeta plus, uh, mu zeta hat plus, and mu zeta uh, hat minus. Okay, so and if I want to be very uh, annoying, this is the projection of this guy. And then I, uh, let me be extremely annoying, and then I take the unstable lift. And then same thing, and now I use the notation. I project and then I take the stable lift. Okay, and then this is on the D minus. And now I, so here I can take, I can leave it. Yeah, and now what I do is I say, okay, this is equal to lambda plus the top exponent of the projection. This is also equal, which also happens to be lambda minus of the projection, but I don't care now. This is also equal to, and this one is lambda minus of the bottom exponent of the projection. Okay, so now I have, what I do, I, I write, um, it's, I mean, there's no technical difficulty. But so now this is, uh, I take Z0 union Z plus, 
And let me add Z minus so I get the whole integral. And now I have to remove what I, uh, the extra thing that I put, that is the integral of lambda plus over this set. And then I have to put back this guy. So this is what gives me the, the, the correction. Well, let's say it's a theta. Okay, so this is over all Z, and this is over Z minus. Okay? Okay, so here I just used the definition of the unstable lift. This is the weak star topology. And this is the fact that uh, here, that uh, new zeta, the projection being everything. It has only two only two possible ergodic limits. Okay, so sometimes it's the unstable lift, this is plus, and sometimes it is the stable lift, this is the minus. Okay, so I mean there is no uh, there is no difficulty except that we have to to remember what we are doing, then we get this. So now what the, the, the so the punchline is this, if we have a discontinuity, if the limit is below what it should be, below the, the exponent of the limiting measure, it means that we have had this leak of measure uh, into the, the stable uh, manifold. The stable graph, sorry. Okay, so that's now we, we remember this and we continue. So we talk about something completely different. So let's now we want to. This was about uh, exponent. Now we want to talk about uh, entropy. So I don't know. So, one uh, nice way to define entropy is to introduce these dynamical distances. Okay, so essentially these are uh, distances between orbit segment. So dn of x and y, you just look at the maximum of the distance between the first n iterates of x and y. Okay, these were introduced by uh, Bowen and uh, Dinaborg. And once you have this distance, you have a corresponding notion of a ball, uh, called the dynamical ball of order n, which is, uh, okay, what you, you expect, what you have a distance. Now that you can define uh, this ball, you can, you can you get uh, a covering number. For instance, if you have a subset of your space, uh, then the covering number, uh, the epsilon n covering number is, as you can expect, the minimum number of such dynamical balls that you need to cover your set. Okay, and now if you have a, a subset, not necessarily invariant, uh, you define uh, its topological entropy by uh, first fixing a scale epsilon, and for this scale epsilon, you measure the exponential growth rate of these co covering numbers, and then you let the scale go uh, to zero. Okay, that's for an arbitrary subset. Uh, the topological entropy of the map, by definition, is when you cover everything. You take x equal to n. Okay, and you count, in some sense, all the orbits of this one. Any question? Okay, so some things that are constantly uh, useful. The, uh, first, the fact that when you iterate, you just multiply 
the topological entropy. Okay, in particular, if you take K uh, to be minus one, it tells you that the inverse has the same topological entropy as the original map. Okay, this is one first use. The second use is that whenever you obtain something, uh, some estimate of the topological entropy up to some constant, okay, this constant does not depend on F. You can get rid of it just by applying the, the estimate to some very large iterate and then dividing by this iterate. Okay, this is something that we will okay. use. The definition of topological entropy is not really symmetric. Yeah, so the original, uh, yeah, the Kohnheim, Andrew, and uh, Adler, I think. They, so they first defined, uh, which first introduced, sorry, first introduced topological entropy. They used a definition using open covers. Because they don't assume there is a metric. So then you don't need to assume that there is a metric. And at some point, the uh, dynamics became lazy and say, okay, let's assume there is a metric. <laughs> so, but for us, it will be convenient to think in this way. Uh, it's not a very deep difference. So, yeah, what, what you do one way, I'm sure you can do it the other way. I'm used to that way. I find it uh, convenient. Uh, I'm not sure I could really prove to you that it's more convenient. Okay, so our first uh, estimate, perhaps due to uh, uh, definition, well, which was proved actually for, for uh, it, well, let me uh, say it, it will be simpler. Suppose that you are on a space which has some finite box, box dimension and that your map is Lipschitz. Okay, then I claim that the topological entropy is bounded by the product of the dimension times the positive part of the logarithm of this Lipschitz concept. Well, in this setting, so okay, the, the, res, the result behind that was proved for uh, metric entropy, for Kolmogorov's in high entropy. Uh, what's his name? Kushnirenko. Uh, uh, for some guy, sorry about that. Uh, and especially it tells you that if you are in a smooth compact setting, the entropy is always finite. Okay, I just want to, to say a little bit more about the proof because this estimate, though it is completely basic, it will be, uh, it's a model for, for other inequalities, which are more sophisticated. But, uh, so how can you prove that? Yeah, I don't want to do it. Uh, really, but I just want to make a picture, which I hope will be convincing. So you want to, you have this definition in mind. So you want to count the how the number of dynamical ball grows when you iterate. So you say, okay, at some stage I will have a. Uh, one ball, and maybe because it contains the a dynamical the image of a dynamical ball, and now I want to understand what happened when I applied it. Okay, and the simplest thing to do when you have this data is to say, okay, what I know is that I will get a ball which is of radius, I will get something, sorry, which is of radius, which is contained in the ball, uh, uh, in a ball of radius, epsilon times the elliptic constant of Okay, and now you want to, to understand your, uh, the dynamical balls, so you, you will have to uh, cut into pieces, which uh, stay inside a single epsilon ball. 
So then you just cover it by both of radius epsilon. Okay, and then you say, okay, oh, oh, always I will assume that the Lipschitz uh, is constant is at least one, just to avoid the uh, thing. And now you say, okay, so I can cover. So, uh, And now this is contained, this is colored itself by a union of uh, something like, so some constant that depends only on your dimension. Okay, so you have this estimate on a single step. Uh, so, and you, from this, you deduce that these coloring numbers will be uh, less than uh, some, <laughs> some constant depending on the space. to the power iterate times the Lipschitz constant of n to the power iterate. Okay, so if you, you have a bound like this, if you put that into the formula, you will get here. Okay, and here you have a further, uh, let's say the covering by the uh, final goal okay, to start with. You take, you take the log, you divide by n, you let n go to infinity. So this kills this first term. You get the log of the Lipschitz constant, which is, a, sorry, I forgot the log is nine, and the dimension, which is what I want. And then I get this log of this constant, which is annoying. But then I apply what I told you, that since it doesn't depend on f, I can just apply this to, to the iterate. This of course I get this thing. Okay, and then I am I, I say okay, this is I can apply it to Fn, I get that the Lipschitz constant of Fn is bounded by the Lipschitz constant of F to the power n, but this doesn't change. So now I say it's one over n. Yeah, and then I keep uh, this, uh, this guy. Any question? Okay, so. That's very uh, basic. Now, uh, so we talked about topological entropy. We will be interested in the entropy of measures. So there is a, uh, so as was, oops, so Kolmogorov, sorry, uh, as Katok uh, observed, you can uh, compute uh, the, the uh, entropy of a measure in a similar way. So what you do is you define covering numbers for a measure, where instead of covering a set, you ask yourself, how many uh, dynamical balls do I need to get some, uh, at least some fixed uh, amount of mass? So this is this lambda. Here lambda is a uh, constant between, strictly between zero and one. It cannot be zero because uh, then I don't cover and I don't ask for anything. And it cannot be one because then I would only be talking about the support 
of the measure. But you can take any number between strictly between zero and one, and then you define the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy of an ergodic measure to be, well, you follow the same uh, recipe as before. You take first a, a, a small scale epsilon. At this small scale, you consider the growth rate of your uh, coverings, this time of the measure, not of, of a given set. And then you let the, uh, the scale epsilon go to zero. And that's for an ergodic measure. If you have a general measure, you use the ergodic decomposition and you declare that the uh, common ground Sinai entropy of the measure is just the average of, it, of that of its ergodic components. Okay, so this was not the way Kolmogorov and Sinai introduced the entropy in the analytical system. And I would say also that though it will be convenient for us, uh, it's not very reasonable uh, in the sense that something that are easy when you do it the, the regular way using partition, measurable partition, become complicated in this uh, when you use that, but we don't care. Uh, so again, we have this uh, behavior under iteration, which we'll use for the same type of reason. The another fact that we will need since we are working with this projective uh, uh, dynamics is to, is to understand what happened to uh, entropy when we have an extension. Okay, assume that you have a topological extension. So you have your system MF, which is an extension of some factor. Yes, okay, you may the continuous, uh, 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 continuous uh, uh, semi-conjugacy. Okay. And then you take a measure, U, you take its uh, factor nu. Okay, and you want to compare the entropy of the measure above with that of the measure below. And what you do, what this theorem of Bowen tells you is that uh, the entropy of the extension is at least as big as the entropy of the factor. And then it's not much, it's uh, how, how bigger can it be? Okay, so it can, it can increase by this quantity, which is the average of the topological entropy of the fibers of your projection. Okay, so Le Drapier Walters proved that this is actually, uh, you actually have a variational principle. I don't want to get into that, I will not use it, because in, my situ in our situation, the bundle extension, the fiber over any point is a circle, Okay, and the dynamics is invertible. So you can show easily that all these numbers are zero. So the, the, so the bundle extension has the nice property that it preserves the entropy. When we lift a measure or when we project a measure to the bundle extension, we don't change its entropy. Okay, we can just forget about that. But we need to know that it's, it's the case. Any question about that? Uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, the fibers are not invariant. The fibers do... are not invariant, exactly. This How is... do you define entropy on this? Uh, you're on using this? the slide before. Sorry. I to yeah, you see, I didn't say that X is, uh, is invariant. This is Bowen definition. Bowen said it in the case where X is compact. Okay, but not necessarily in time. You just count the number of orbits that start from X. And, Thank you. and this, is a, this is what you need in this setting. I mean, it's not completely clear that it is, uh, uh, I mean, the proof is not completely obvious, but it's, 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 I think it's more or less clear that this is what you, that what you want to understand is uh, what is the dynamic starting from your fiber. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, I didn't uh, say it, but 
yeah, you, you uh, please uh, feel free to to interrupt. Okay, so now there is a well known uh, and important link between the topological entropy and the entropies of measure. This is the variational principle. Okay, so that tells you that the topological entropy, which counts all orbits, is the supremum of the uh, Kolmogorov Sinai entropies, which count only uh, orbits relevant to some measure. Okay, and since we have put it to the definition that the entropy of an arbitrary measure is the average of the entropies of its ergodic component, then it's obvious that the, uh, you taking the soup over all invariant measure or over all ergodic and invariant measure is the same. Okay, I won't uh, say more about this variational principle except that it's really important and that there is a very, uh, now the classical proof is the very nice proof by Mijuevich. Okay, so this, tell, this brings into focus. So first it tells us that it's reasonable to look for sequences of measures, entropy goes to the topological entropy. Okay, so this always exists. Okay, and then we sometimes we are lucky, and in fact, we will be in a lucky setting. Uh, not only there is this supremum, but actually there are measures that satisfy uh, that realize the supremum, then we call them a measure maximizing the entropy or enemy. Okay, that's the name I, uh, I couldn't remember. So the, the, the bound whose proof I sketched here is Kushnirenko's bound. Okay, so I stated it for topological entropy. If I'm lazy, I will say that by the variational principle, it's also a bound on the, the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy of any measure. And now there is a refined version, which will be uh, fundamental for us, which is fundamental for many body, which is a uh, real inequality, which actually was proved for uh, smooth measures before by Margulis. But and now it's called real, in real inequality. What does it tell you? It tells you that for any ergodic measure, the entropy uh, of, this, of this measure is bounded by uh, uh, the top Lyapunov exponent if this top Lyapunov exponent is positive or it is zero otherwise. I mentioned. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, sum up. Yeah. Or usually, the sum of the Lyapunov exponent of the positive Lyapunov exponent that I didn't define. So here I I stick now to dimension two. And then complex equations are famous when you write twice. Twice. You, you think about it's really a real. Uh, okay. And the proof, uh, the, the Let's say that the picture behind the real inequality is the same picture and behind Kushner and Gold uh, bound, just that instead of just using the Lipschitz constant, you say, okay, I, am, uh, I have a ball. If it is very small, it will be expanded like by the differential of F. Okay, and then I use Oseletes theorem to tell me that if I, if I look at a sufficiently great iterate, if I restrict myself to a set of points of, uh, if I throw away a set of points of very small measure, then this differential of a big iterate of L will be essentially given by the Lyapunov exponent. Okay, and then I can, I will, I will be able to prove that. Okay, so uh, something that follows, so what follows from real inequality, I mean, maybe it's very, you have this uh, easy consequence, but 
easy but very important. That tells you that if you have a measure with positive entropy for a surface diffeomorphism, then it is hyperbolic in the sense of PSC. And more precisely, so first applying this, you see that if this is positive, it means that the top Lyapunov exponent must be uh, at least is lower bounded by this entropy. And now, since you have a diffeomorphism, you can uh, consider the inverse of f. The entropies, I mean, the invariant measure don't change. The entropies don't change. So then you, you when you apply uh, real inequality to f inverse and mu, so the entropy stays the same. The Lyapunov exponent, uh, the top Lyapunov exponent with respect to the inverse is minus the bottom exponent of lambda mu, of, of mu, sorry, and you get this other inequality. So when you have, if the entropy, if you have a lower bound on the entropy, you have a lower bound on the, you know that you have a one positive and one negative exponent and with a, a lower bound on the absolute value given by the entropy. Any questions? Okay, so something we won't use, but which is uh, very uh, uh, interesting and which really completes the, the picture in my mind is that we have this upper bound where actually uh, the Drapier Young theory, in fact, Young uh, uh, theory for surface is would suffice, gives you an identity. It's not only that you are bound by the exponent. But you can really write the entropy as a, as a sum of product of exponents and dimensions. Okay, so this is not the subject today. It's a little bit softer, even just to, to write out. Uh, but uh, uh, let's say culturally, it is uh, uh, important. But for us, this is really the, 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 the what will be fundamental is this. And this easy consequence may be first observed by Kato that in dimension two in vertical systems, positive entropy implies hyperbolicity in the sense of placing. Okay, so now. Take a break now. Do this slide. Uh, I, I think I'm almost finished. Yeah, let, let, let me, let me uh, at least this. Okay, so now we, so we saw a catalog formula for color growth in entropy. It told us that uh, to compute the entropy, you have to find, uh, to count how many uh, exciting end balls you need to get some measure. Now there is a, a uh, fiber version of this. Okay, so to explain what it is, we have to, go, to introduce the unstable uh, disintegration of uh, uh, a hyperbolic measure. So this is what we, we do now. Okay, so you take an invariant measure, you assume it to be placed in hyperbolic. This means that mu almost every point, you have a lambda plus is positive, and lambda minus is negative. Okay, so and now what uh, essentially Lodra P. Young uh, tell you is that there exists, okay, there is some way to essentially uh, uh, disintegrate your hyperbolic measure into measures carried by the unstable uh, manifold, by piercing unstable manifold. Okay, so for technical reasons, you cannot just use the partition into unstable manifold. You have to introduce something else that I don't want to, to really talk about. But let's let me just uh, pretend that it's not there. So you get a family of probability measures. 
okay, whose uh, integral gives you back the original measure. This is the disintegration. Each of these unstable measures lives on the unstable on the piecing unstable manifold, and you can ask it to live just on a small piece of it. Okay, let me remind you the unstable manifold uh, is the set of orbit of X, the set of orbit, the set of point Y whose orbit converge exponentially fast to that of X. Okay, and now this you take a small, uh, a small subset of lengths, let's say epsilon, and you can ask that these measures they lived on that. Okay, and now the, the, you can uh, recover the entropy in the following way for almost every point. You can just this time compute this formula, which is just uh, the same as Catoc formula, except that instead of covering mu, you just could cover the disintegration of mu. Okay, so you should think that you have a, you have these uh, unstable uh, manifold. Maybe they they become quite complicated at some at some point, but not really they are it's it's uh, immersed uh, uh, sub manifold. And now you have your you have your measure. Okay, yeah, think of it as some kind of carried by some kind of quantum set. Okay, so the catalog told you count all the points in the in the for you. Here, uh, let us can now tell, tell us just count those which are in, inside a piece of unstable manifold. So there are in particular uh, typical points for you, which are inside one single uh, unstable manifold. Okay, so it's uh, the point for us is that it will it tells us that uh, to compute the entropy and especially to bind, bound it, it's enough to uh, look at the typical points inside a typical unstable manifold. Okay, and because we will need to, to deal with curves and this is, this is how the curves, the curves are the unstable manifold. So, uh, okay, I, I, I can take a break now. Uh, excuse me, the measure is algorithmic or this definition is uh, here? Ah, yeah, you're, you're sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. Here is circle. If it's not ergodic, here for almost every point, you get the entropy of the ergodic component. So yes, it should be ergodic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so to finish the, the general, what we need from the general theory of entropy uh, for diffeomorphisms, or we need to speak about pen entropy. <laughs> so this is a quantity that was defined, well, in another way, uh, by Mijurevich. Uh, in this, we, we called it uh, conditional topological entropy for reasons that are uh, not completely uh, obvious, but we don't care. What is the Taylor entropy? So as a matter of formula, so here I give you the formulas. Essentially, this is, what do you do to compute uh, this quantity? You look at an arbitrary epsilon n ball and you ask yourself, okay, now let's take delta to be much smaller than epsilon, okay? How many delta n balls do I need to cover an arbitrary 
epsilon n goal. Okay, and then you, you are interested in the exponential growth rate as usual. Okay. And finally, the tail entropy is the limit when the scale epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so I think the most, uh, so what, what we will use and what uh, sheds probably the, the most light on why we need, well, why it's interesting to make this definition is the following. Okay, it tells you that when you want to compute uh, the entropy, either the entropy of a set, the topological entropy of a set, or the entropy of an invariant measure, okay? The tail entropy tells you, okay, don't worry, you can compute it at some fixed scale. Here I have fixed some positive epsilon. Okay, I, I, and I can tell you in advance how much uh, you, can, you may have lost by uh, working at, at this fixed scale and not letting the scale go to infinity, to go to zero, sorry. And the, the answer is the tail entropy. Okay, so if the, so, well, for a general system, uh, the tail entropy is what it is. Okay, it's between zero and the topological entropy. When it's equal to the topological entropy, it really doesn't do any, any, anything for you. Uh, but when it is zero, it, it, it tells you a lot of things. In particular, it tells you that if you need to do your computations to get uh, some contradiction in your proof at some, uh, with some precision that you know, okay, then you know at which scale. Uh, it tells you that there is a scale, a fixed scale, in which you can uh, work. And it will be enough to do your estimates at this scale uh, uh, if you are only uh, requiring the, the, uh, this precision. Okay, so essentially, uh, entropy is defined by taking these very annoying double limits. Tail entropy, when it is zero, tells you that up to an arbitrary uh, error, uh, you can fix in advance the scale at which you, you, you want to work and essentially forget about the second limit. Okay, so uh, uh, perhaps the most important the names when you don't when you don't go with h star to limit, you have the zero at some pylon already, then I think it was introduced by Owen. When h star is zero, Mishrevich called it the absolute topic h expands. Yeah, so so there is a sequence. There is a sequence. Yeah, it, there is a sequence of papers. I think in the late seventies, or at least in the seventies, by Bowen and by Mizurevich, where essentially one says, "Look, I have this condition that implies that uh, there is a measure of maximal entropy," and the other guy says, "Oh, but I have a counterexample, and I have a better condition than yours." Okay, and, uh, and so. I think Mizurevich first introduced conditional topological entropy, and then Bo and then Bowen introduced some this formula exactly that the uh, closer closest to the, the spirit uh, that we have been working in. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit more complicated than what I said. Okay, and then uh, so this is this brings me to this very important proposition which tells you that if the, top of, if the tail entropy is zero, then you can prove that the entropy map is upper semi-continuous. Okay, as you said, this was the tail entropy being zero was defined, was called asymptotic H expansiveness. Uh, the different because uh, following the sequence of papers, when, so first people knew that when you are expensive, this map is a person being continuous. And then maybe Bowen said, okay, if it's entropy expensive in the sense that this quantity H star of F for some epsilon is equal to zero, then the, you have this upper semi-continuity. And then uh, maybe Luzerevich uh, said, oh, but it's enough that the limit is zero. 
Okay, so that's uh, yes, it's upper semi continuous, and now you use uh, the, th the theorem that tells you that if you have an upper semi continuous function over a non empty compact set, uh, the function achieves its uh, supremum. And this exactly means uh, there exists MMEs. Okay, and it's very uh, uh, nice or maybe striking that in some sense, if you have this condition, then you get existence of MMEs without uh, doing uh, any further dynamics. Okay, so a, a kind of statistic exercise, well, statistic for me and masochistic for you, is to prove the upper semi-continuity uh, here using the framework I've given you. I warned you that uh, uh, this business about epsilon and ball is very convenient, but it's not very reasonable to only uh, introduce it, introduce entropy like that, especially to avoid speaking about entropy with respect to partitions. And it is one point where you, you would pay if you did not know about partition. Okay, but it's still possible to do it. But uh, I mean, the way I know how to do it, if I don't want to use the entropy with respect to partition is uh, really, uh, well, it's convoluted. Uh, and now, the, so you can say, okay, that's very nice to know that entropy expensive, entropy H expensive uh, maps have MME, but uh, okay, are there many of them? It turns out that as a consequence of your mean theory, so first Newhouse showed that uh, the upper semi-continuity, okay, and in fact, in my, so a long time ago in my PhD thesis, I realized that if you look uh, more closely at Yomdin's proof, you realize that you, you directly get uh, that the Taylor entropy is equal to zero, okay, which have other consequences also uh, but, uh, about uh, symbolic extension uh, entropy, but uh, it's not uh, okay. okay, so, and this is a consequence of Yomdin's theory, which, very softly, we uh, uh, switch over to other questions about that. That's, uh, okay, so. Sorry, what is the point of seeing the equalities in the new house theorem? What is the point of seeing the equalities? So that you may wonder when is it the case that the Terra entropy is zero. Okay, this theorem tells you that uh, a sufficient condition is for the map to be C infinity. If the map is C infinity, you don't need to know anything more about its dynamics. The Terra entropy. Allow you make entropy. If you have CR, then this wiggling uh, CR gives you entropy over R. It is here. Check it on the ground. Okay, so that's the next. Okay, so the what I want to do here, because I will need it uh, in the to, to, to prove our main theorem, uh, is to explain uh, uh, Yonding's theory. And actually, we can go uh, quite, uh, we can be quite complete uh, when we restrict ourselves to curves, which are the, the main, uh, uh, what we really need uh, for us. Okay, so I will introduce the ba basic objects in uh, Yomdin theory, which is when you look at parameterized uh, disk, you need to define uh, what is the CR size of a map or of a disk. Then we state the, in some sense, the, so we would explain what is our reparameterization, when is it good? Essentially, we want to uh, do some kind of entropy, but instead of uh, looking at distances and balls, we look at uh, reparameterizations. 
Okay, I, I, I will say, I'll give you the details. And then we'll get, I mean, the fundamental result of Young Dean is about what happens when you take, uh, you have a curve, you take the image by a map, okay, and you look at the part of the image that is inside uh, a small ball, okay, and you want to understand uh, what happens. And Young Dean tells you, uh, okay, uh, nothing happens if you are very small. This, this uh, has applications to volume growth, okay, uh, entropy, Schub entropy conjecture and tail entropy, okay, and uh, I hope I will have the time. There is to, 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 come to prove this uh, basic theorem. You, you have a lemma about composition of maps uh, of Euclidean spaces. Uh, which is in fact quite simple for curves. And uh, so I hope to, to get to that. Okay, so that's the plan. So for now I fix a regularity, a finite regularity, uh, R larger than or equal to one. To, okay, there is a technical problem of defining the CR size. Okay, one a simple way, but very elegant is to fix a finite uh, collection of charts, okay? Now, uh, we'll see it's, it's not the natural objects are parameterized the disk that you can call a singular in the sense that you don't care. Uh, these are just uh, maps from the unique uni cube in whichever dimension uh, that you want into your manifold. Okay, smooth maps, CR yeah, maps. Okay, and you don't care whether they are they have critical points or not. See, this is the sense in which you may want to call them si uh, singular. Okay, and now uh, we want to define CR size of uh, such disk. So these disks are defined from the subset of Euclidean space into a manifold to be able to define uh, higher order derivatives and their, their, let's say, operator norm, uh, we just used our finite atlas, okay? So if we have a, a map into the manifold, we look at all, uh, the, all the charts into which there is some part of the image of the, of the disk, okay? We, and we just uh, look at the, at all the partial uh, derivatives uh, up to order R, okay, in, in all places, in all the subsets that you can have. Okay, so that's the, the CR size. And we have a modified the CR size, especially, so especially for the, so now for F, which is the map, which will be the dynamics, so from M to M, okay, where here it's like before, so you use the charts. Okay, this is defined on some set, maybe empty, then there is nothing, but uh, you look at all the, all the parts where all the IJ so that it's uh, not empty, and you, con and you consider the size of the derivatives, except that here you omit the first order derivatives. Essentially, because in the application, we, all the higher order derivatives can be made small by choosing charts that zoom. Okay, but of course this doesn't change uh, the Lipschitz constant of your map. So the first order is uh, naturally different from the higher order derivatives. Questions? Okay, so a disk is uh, just a, a CR map defined on the unit cube into a manifold. And the CR size is Define using the charts, okay, from this finite set. Otherwise, it would always, more or less, always be infinite. But then it's so it's some quantity. Of course, it depends on the choices of the chart. But the idea is that it doesn't depend uh, too much. I mean, if you have a bound for one finite set of chart, you will get another bound for another set of charts. Okay. 
So now we want to we so what we are going to be doing following Yang Din is uh, reparameterizing. Okay, so we have M uh, dimension D. We have a, our smooth map. Here we don't care if it's invertible. Okay, again, I want to avoid uh, stupid uh, cases. So I assume that the, the supremum of the uh, first order differential is not less than one. I am not looking at a contract, contracting map, which anyway will, will have zero entropy and so on. Okay, so now I take a disk, sigma, and I fix some epsilon, and I will say that I have an epsilon admissible reparameterization of sigma over some subset. If what it is, this reparameterization, it's a collection of CR maps from the unit cube into the unit cube, okay, which satisfies the following two conditions. First, I should make a picture because uh, when you write it like that, the first time it may be frightening, but in fact, it's very simple. So this is, This is your disk inside M. Okay, this is the image of the disk. Maybe there are some multiple points, so we don't care. And now we have this set T. So T is a subset of the of here. And now, uh, well, my uh, reparameterization is a collection of maps. So I put them inside. What I want is that the image of uh, all the reparameterizations cover the set of parameters I am interested in. This is the set T. Okay, that's the, the first thing because yeah, I want to, to, to go to keep track of, of what happens to that set. And now my epsilon is I want that this reparameterization uh, to make, I want them to make the CR size small. So, I want, so this essentially means that all uh, alpha derivatives up to order R are bounded by one. Okay, and then uh, it is my uh, PSD physics. I also want them to be contraction. And in fact, it's when you do it without uh, asking yourself, this is what you get. There is no. Uh... Okay, so this is, uh, I have a disk which maybe has large CR size. And now I have an, an epsilon admissible reparameterization will be a collection of. So now I will essentially have split. So I had this. Uh, this disk sigma, okay, over T. And now I can just look at this psi i, sorry, sigma composed with psi i uh, over, uh, okay, this will be psi i minus one. Okay, and I had one disk, I have several disks now, but what I have gained is that the CR size is uh, is normalized, is at most one. Okay, that's the that's uh, the definition. And then the key result of Yamdin is this one step a local estimate. So Yamdin tells you once we are you have fixed 
the regularity R, the dimension D, I mean, K is always less than D. So essentially all the big parameters are fixed. There is some uh, scale, okay, which depends on the CR size of your map, such that you will have the following uh, good thing when you take epsilon, not larger than, it, than this, uh, this constant, okay, which has, so, so it's very uniform. Okay, and this constant is not mysterious. It's just uh, how much zooming you need to kill the higher order derivative of this map. Okay, so then what, what is the good property? Is that each time, each time sorry, you take a uh, uh, parameterized disk, sorry, it, the, the thing, uh, uh, so it's parameterized disk, and a point inside this disk. And then you take, uh, you, you focus on the, on the parameters such that uh, the image by F, so you are going to apply F to, the, to your disk. Okay, but you have this here, you add some, you choose some point, and now you have here its image. Okay, you only uh, are interested in, uh, in the ball of, of radius epsilon around this. this. Okay, I'm a little bit worried, but we'll see. Uh, I think here it should be a sign also. Then the claim is that you have, you can subdivide by a, a reparameterization your disk such that the image. Oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, several. Uh, okay, let me uh, revise it here. I'm sorry. Okay, so there exists this epsilon. Okay, so that for all. Oh, sorry, it should be a TR star. At most epsilon, okay, at zero, then the T is the points, the parameters, such that the image stays close to some point. So it's X zero, I'm sorry. Then there is it. Uh, an epsilon admissible reparameterization of, of not of sigma, but of uh, n composed with sigma. Okay, this. And so this means that we have these two properties. We have reparameterized everything, all the part of the DC that falls that fall into that small ball, okay? And uh, with uh, this, uh, yeah, and, and with this bound on CR and using uh, contracting, weakly contracting reparameterization. And now the, the point is that, of course, we can always reparameterize and make the derivative smaller, 
the point is that if you don't think, or in fact, if we didn't take the intersection with the ball at the, the epsilon ball at the image, we would just say that the cardinality would be like the this Lipschitz constant of f to the power of the dimension, okay? But in fact, Yandin tells us we have much better, we have, uh, we can here uh, take the power one over r. So we divide by r uh, uh, here, so the smoother you are, we are, uh, the more, uh, the less we have to pay. Okay, so that's... Uh, Okay, this is divided by R. This is the whole point of this business. So we are going to consider simply enough. So we can take R to be as large as we want, very, very large. And therefore, this quantity uh, will be uh, very, very small, very close to one. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, we don't know how gamma grows with R, but you see that gamma, so this is the usual trick, gamma does not depend on F. So we apply this. So we are going to, from this, we are going to get, uh, we are going to get uh, uh, this, but the, 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 so this is, okay, Yondin is basically someone who does uh, analysis and geometry, he's not uh, really a dynamicist. So if you are a dynamicist, uh, then you iterate what your friend has given you and you get this statement. Okay, the statements, okay, they are the same mistakes. You take a, a parameterized caddis, uh, with the size at most epsilon, uh, there is no more, sorry, there is no more epsilon, there is no more x and zero. Sorry. Okay, but then you, you iterate, so you, little n is the iterate, and what, uh, just applying what, uh, the, the, this basic theorem, you get that you can reparameterize. Sorry, ah, this is f n. No, no, sorry, no, that's good. That's okay. Sorry, you can reparameterize the, the sigma over, in fact, everything if you if you want, provided that you insert here. So you see that you have. Uh, you will, what, what happens is that. You will apply on each on, for each ball for each epsilon ball in the image. You apply the basic estimate. Okay, it gives you so you start with sigma. First, you you consider f composed with sigma. Okay, so you had. Sigma, so you had some let's uh, some some disk in the manifold. Now you apply f sigma. You have some. You have the image. Okay. Now you use the. Okay, you want to apply the basic estimate. What you do is that you cover by epsilon balls. And then for each of these epsilon balls, you apply the uh, basic estimate. Okay, so you get uh, an epsilon admissible reparameterization with a cardinality bounded by the constant times df to the power k over l. Okay, and now you, so this splits into, Okay, you have the number of epsilon balls. 
And for each, you get uh, this reparameterized uh, disk, which each have again size uh, at most epsilon. Here it draws, and how you, now you bring it back. Okay, and now you, you do it again. Okay, you are dynamicist, so when you start doing something, you don't stop. Okay, you take the image by F. Now it's the image not of sigma, but of sigma uh, reparameterized by psi. Okay, it gets, you get something, uh, some, some larger disk, uh, probably. You look at one epsilon ball. Okay, and now maybe you need to, maybe the image is of this epsilon ball is uh, much bigger. So you need to subdivide it according to the epsilon balls here. Or if you prefer, uh, epsilon n equal to two balls uh, when you're looking at here. Okay, and you, and you, you for each of these balls, you split. Okay, how much do you need to split? Okay, always the same thing. Okay, when you do that, if you do it correctly, you obtain this bound for the, for the number of reparameterization after time n, so that you keep uh, dealing with this of CR size at most epsilon. Okay, and now, okay, what you have, when you have a reparameterization like that, an epsilon reparameterization, it is, remember that it is contracting. Each step is contracting. So in fact, now the, the claim that I need to do is to say, when you have an, uh, an admissible reparameterization, how do you get uh, Sorry, no, this is not what I... So now you, you see that this... Okay, let me not get ahead of myself. Now you can apply this. Since you have parameterizations, you can uh, compute volumes. Okay, and now this is... Uh, so for instance, you can take any disk of any dimension. Okay, if you need... Uh, if it has a large CR size, you just split it into finitely many disks with epsilon, uh, epsilon size, epsilon CR size, okay? And now you can apply the previous theorem, okay? To this, what is the, this is the, just the volume, this integral is just the volume of the image of the disk, okay? Since uh, these guys, so this integral, is a sum over the, rep the rep reparameterization here, this one, of uh, the integral for each of the disk. The integral for each of the disk is bounded by some constant, okay, which is less than one if epsilon is small. Anyway, you get something here, which is uh, bounded essentially by the cardinality of your reparameterization. Okay, therefore you get that its growth rate will be bound, which is what we are computing here, will be bounded by uh, what this gives. Okay, so what you get is that the growth rate of volume is bounded by the topological entropy plus the log of this constant plus k, so there is no k, d over r, since we take the maximum of the dimension of this. And now you apply the usual trick to first, you get rid of that guy because it doesn't depend on f, just by going to an iterate. Okay, and now you, since you, f is infinite, 
you are allowed to take R arbitrarily large and you get rid of them. Okay, and you get that the volume growth is bounded by the topological entropy. This was the, the goal of uh, Young Ding's uh, paper. Why? Because if you have, when the, this growth of volume bounds the homological growth, okay, and this was should conjecture, at least should conjecture it for any C1 map. Okay, and this is the uh, Young Ding in this way got a proof for an EC infinity map. Uh, How could I prevent you? So entropy conjecture or conjecture is for C1, but the object proved it for C infinity. They did not kill to conjecture sure. because, because here is homology. And C1 is false, but you have homology, so you can replace your chain. It's homologous ones, which makes this growth slower than just growth of volume. Yes. So there is a good chance that entropy conjecture of this growth in homology, not just volume. Yes. But people think it is done. No, no, it's not done. It, I don't think about this it, fantastic it, entropy conjecture anymore, thinking it is done. But no, it's not that at all. But C1 it, to it, understand it, the homologous and this and smooth theory. Yeah, in some sense, it's like this proof of existence of MME, where C infinity is a sufficient condition. But uh, okay, and some people can think it's kind of cheating because we are dynamics and we are get and one gives us a, a, an answer which has uh, it's not clear how dynamical it is. So yes, true conjecture is this for homological growth and it is in C1. This solved for any C infinity map or a compact thing, but thing, but yes, yes, you could uh, keep it to that, but it doesn't uh, solve the, 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 the conjecture in general. It's yeah. just a big step. May I ask a question? Yes. I got the loss because first you had this R. Yes. Then you said volume. I see for the first time. So I didn't understand. For when is this volume? What is this volume? What it's, it's, it's this formula. You have to. It's so, okay. I didn't. I didn't. Everything is CR. Yeah. If you take, if you replace F by F by an iterate, it multiplies the volume goes. Okay, I use that implicitly. When I say just by taking an iterate, you can kill this term. Of course, you have to check that this is also multiplied by n if you replace f by f. My question is more basic. What is this? I don't think you will find volume. Is this? <laughs> Sigma parameterizes so many points on it. Sigma parameterizes so many points on it. Which is the role of the many for that integration. Yes, yeah, so it's this it, definition. Okay, so I, I, the thing that I didn't say is that it seems to. Okay, I'm Okay, so anyway, I, I, I didn't want to go there without uh, giving you this consequence, which was the motivation of your view. Jacobian is maximum. Jacobian is maximum. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's four dimension. Yeah, anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to. Parameterization. Okay, so that's one. So this is one application of you have of Yamdin theorem. Okay, that was actually uh, done by Young Din. Okay, from our point of view, there is this other application, which is you, you keep inside, essentially you do what we did, but you keep, you stay inside an epsilon n ball. Instead of trying to cover everything which uh, introduces the topological entropy, you focus on the neighborhood of a given orbit. 
When you do that, you get that uh, the Pell entropy of a CR map will be bounded by uh, the dimension divided by R times the logarithm of the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so for infinity, you get that the Pell entropy is zero. Okay, so, sorry, okay, there is one thing. So what, one thing I wanted to say, and I don't know why. Yeah, this is now the time we did. So for Pell entropy, Oh, yes, okay. I just want to complete that. Is that if you have okay, it gives you a uh, final uh, cover. Okay, just because you you have your your cube, you have its image. And you know that here, you see the right hand. So here, what you do is simply you take something which is, let's say, silent dance. Okay, so this is a fixed number, like from a very silent. To the power k. Okay. Since this is the contracting, you will get inside here something which is epsilon base. And if you apply the basic theorem inductively, then in fact, what you will get is that for each, you will have a sequence of reparameterizations, which are uh, composed, which are composition of contracting reparameterizations, so they are themselves uh, contracting. Therefore, you get uh, something which is also, which is in fact an epsilon n cover when you iterate. Okay, so sorry, I'm uh, rushing this. Uh, yeah, so you have something, yeah, the epsilon and cover, so the union of the epsilon ball uh, cover your, 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 your thing, and in this way, you get this, using this ID, you show that the bound on the sequence of admissible reparameterization that you get uh, by iterating this basic theorem, Will be a bound on the uh, okay. Will be a bound on the uh, epsilon n cover that you need inside your board. Okay, so in fact, I should. Yeah, you take delta. So you have your epsilon single side epsilon. It is uh, reparameterized by uh, by an inductive uh, application of this theorem, and it gives you uh, it gives you in the in the definition of the tail entropy, you had this quantity, which was the cover number by delta n volt of and then final end Okay, and so what you see here is that you can make the delta arbitrary small without uh, doing anything with epsilon, just in this way that the, each of the fixative reparameterization being contracting, it's enough that in the uh, parameter cube, you have, you take a delta dense subset, to get a delta n dense uh, subset uh, of uh, the epsilon n ball. Okay, and this is in this way that you get the bound on the topologic on the tail entropy. Okay, so sorry, I think I'm on the next page. What is on the next page? 
Well, the next page. It, well, okay, I can tell you what is on the next page. But okay. So the 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 the, 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 last, the mathematical page. Okay, uh, it's what we have to prove to uh, to get the the main the basic Yardin estimate uh, for uh, curves. Okay, so this is what so well it's essentially a rewriting, but uh, without uh, I mean in charts what we need. Okay, so the assumption being. That we control all higher order derivatives of f, but not the Lipschitz constant. Sigma is controlled. I mean, all the derivatives are controlled, and we we have this uh, reparameterization uh, around what falls into a neighborhood of the. We control the image only uh, in a something of uh, unique size. Okay, uh, and we have this the, 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 the same bound as what is claimed here, k is equal to one. Okay, and now, but now the point was to do the proof. So I don't know if I will do the proof on Monday. I think I will just put it in the slides uh, this afternoon. I mean, you can ask me and then I will tell you, but uh, <laughs> it's not just five minutes. So. <laughs> okay, what is this? This one well just. Uh, send in the slides. Yeah, yeah, I said this slide. And as I said, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I put them here also. But I would like to write an example here. Yes. One line along to where I exist. Ask why it equals R times a time. Of one over x, the pair in the plane, and then try to. The making would be just here is zero, here is attraction, here is expansion, that everything is close to a cell, and try to think about growth of this curve close to this point. This is. An example of what you were talking yeah. about, and this was example was known before Young, and people were thinking, uh, well, how to use this example. Some also participated in this. And this example, when you iterate it, Vertical direction is important. Horizontal doesn't matter. But for the subtle, then you will see phenomena which yeah, you explain it. Yeah, you, you get yeah, well what if it's CR curve. Then you have a CR curve and then you just expand uh, vertically. Yeah. And it's enough to so if you wish you can take just horizontal line, but the mapping being CR only gives you. Yeah, but you, you really need something not not infinity just at the beginning. And then it's just linear expansion and it is enough to to ruin your day or Yes, yeah, I think it's more.